and then we'll switch on over. So we're going to switch on over here to the, oops, where's the share button? Share screen. And oh, I before I share the screen, I did want to point out to you, I'm going to share, well, I'm going to share a different screen. I'm sharing our Canvas page. Well, that is not our Canvas page. That is the 202 Canvas page. Okay, so I will be sharing our Canvas page. That is right here. We'll go into Unit 4. I posted these sheets that you're going to want to print out. So if you scroll down, see way down here where it says skeleton feature list parenthesis cheat sheet. And then over here it says muscle list parenthesis cheat sheet. So it's way at the bottom of the columns here. But they are no muscle list or skeleton feature list. They are, I'm going to stop share. I'm going to share a different page. There we go. This here is the muscle list. So we're not in muscles yet, but I just wanted to let you know this is going to be for the muscles. You're able to utilize that for your um, practical exam. This is your skeleton feature list. So it's in alphabetical order. This is all the stuff that we have now, and you can have that with you when you take your exam on Monday, or I, the first, should call it an exam, the first half of your practical quiz on Monday. So that's this here, and that was on Canvas, so you can see that where it said skeleton cheat sheet. Okay, so we'll go back to the PowerPoint here. Where's it? There it is. Share. Okay, so we're on to appendicular skeleton. This is tiny here. We did the pectoral girdle, so we did part one. We would also jump down to the pelvic girdle, so we completed part three. And then we're going to do, oops, where did that go? Okay, delete. Okay, um, I forgot my new, my mouse has all kinds of funky buttons on it that cut and paste and do crazy things. So we're going to start with this upper limb. So I'm going to go over here and scroll down until we get to the upper limb. And so you can have that in your notes. So make sure you're to your notes where it says part two, upper limb, we're going to do the arm. So the arm is made up of, we have the the upper arm, which is the humerus, we have, here I'll stop sharing so we can, so the arm is the humerus, which is your upper arm bone, and so that's considered your arm, and then your forearm is obviously your forearm, right, and then you have the wrist, we have eight carpal bones, then you have um, the hand, which is this part, and then you have the phalanges, which are the fingers. So we're going to learn about the one single bone that's the humerus that's in the upper arm. We have the radius and ulna that are going to be our forearm. You'll need to know the names of all eight of the carpal bones, but you won't, um, I won't be, you won't need to know their place. Just if you recognize its name or know some of the names of the carpal bones. And then um, the metacarpals is your hand. You just need to know there's five of them. And then the phalanges are your fingers and in each other's 14 of them. And you'll figure out why there's 14 and not 15 when we get to our lecture. Oh, there's the PowerPoint, okay. So here we go. Okay, so on the lab guide, this is these are this is the list of the features on the lab guide that you will need to know. This is um, so the humerus has quite a large number. We have the ulna, radius, the carpal list. Those are just the list of the bones, metacarpals, and then the phalanges. And let's get to the humerus. Let me grab one. I have two. I think I have one right and left. So I'm gonna just move here and just do the stop share. So while you're looking at that, I can have the humerus here in front. So I have two humerus bones. One's been drawn on, not by me, but it was done before, but it's handy because it does show some of the features. So normally I'm kind of against drawing on these things. So you you have a head, let me get the non-drawn one. It looks like this. You have one side that has this dip that actually looks like a ladle. Like if you're gonna go Fred Flintstone and you're just gonna like stir a label, ladle, it's a dip right in here that your finger can kind of pop right in. That's gonna face backwards. That's gonna be to the back of your arm. Obviously this upper part is the head. 
So you can see this smooth part here, that's actually gonna be inside your shoulder joint. That's what's you know, gonna be cupping into that glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity. So this will be the head and we'll go through the features. So this is gonna be up and then this knobby part is down. So you got that, so up and down. And then we have to figure out which is front and back. Well, here's the ladle side, that's gonna be back. So we know this is gonna face this way. So then the question is, obviously the head's gonna curve inward. So it makes sense that this here is my right humerus. Whereas this one here, we can see how both of these knobby bottoms and see how the back is both of these little ladle dip holes. So that's the back side. So now we have, here's the front side and then we go and we see this is the head turning inward and this is the head turning in this way. So this is how you could determine right and left. Later when we get to it, you'll actually be able to put, when we put our fingers down, the widest point that these fingers go, you can actually feel that on your own arm. And we'll, those are the epicondyles. So we'll go back to the share screen. So we wanna look for that rounded head and the bottom and the dip like a soup ladle, that's the posterior. So we'll look at the features. We have the head, we'll look at it here and then I'll pop off and you can see it on the real bone. So the head is gonna be the rounded portion the anatomical neck is right at the base of the head. That's actually different than the surgical neck. The surgical neck is actually right here. I don't have that, it's one of the features, but it's not listed on your list. I just wanted to point out why they call something an anatomical neck rather than just plain old neck. Well, because there's another neck out there, surgical neck, it just doesn't seem to make our list. Then there is the greater tubercle. So a tubercle is a knobby bulbous part. So the greater tubercle is just higher up and bigger. Lesser tubercle is lower and smaller. Then there's an intertubecular groove. So the fact that it says intertubecular, it's actually right between the two tubercles. That's why it says. It's also known as the bicipital. And bicipital, that's because later, we can learn that the biceps brachii actually goes right through that. One of the tendons for the biceps brachii, your muscle goes through there. Then there's a deltoid tuberosity. So here we have greater and lesser tuber tubercles. We have the intertubecular groove, which is the groove between them. The deltoid tuberosity is like a rough spot halfway down the bone that the deltoid muscle attaches to. On the far end, it's all the knobby and gnarly at the far end. We have our medial and lateral condyles. Those are the things that you can feel if you run your fingers down your bone and then the widest point that your fingers would be splayed out, but you can still feel your bone are your medial and lateral epicondyles. The medial is obviously closer to your body, laterals away from your body. Then we have, I think we have these. So that would be your medial epicondyle and that's your lateral epicondyle. Now the reason why we have epi means above because technically the smooth surface here are condyles and in the femur they are called condyles, but because these guys are such a weird shape, well, they get weird names. So they're not, they're technically these guys are condyles, but they actually have weird names. So the word epicondyle just means really a ridge above the bottom smooth articulating surface. Now these bottom little gnarly things, we have the trochlea, and the trochlea looks kind of like a spool of thread, if you have a really good imagination. So it's like a sideways spool of thread, um, like well not of thread, the spool that the thread would go in, because it's actually narrow. So it literally is wider, kind of gets narrow, wider here, narrow like that. So that is the trochlea. Then you have the capitulum, which is only this round surface right here. And because I have to come up with really wacky ways to remember things, and I'm feeling back from when I was a student, I always think it's a circle, so it looks like a head, and you can put a baseball cap on it. That's my really funky baseball cap. So it's the only way, and I'm just gonna take that little color off, because you have, I'm gonna take nine and 10 off, but you can see 
you, it looks like these three bumps and I'm like, oh, there's only two things. So it helped me to think of, well, one is just really round. So that, or a C, it's like rounded like a C. Whereas the other two are together for the trochlea or T for two, something like that. But that gets confusing. Then on the flip this around the back and then you have your olecranon fossa. I guess it's not on that picture. So I'm gonna to go to this picture. This is telling you how it's supposed to be said or written. And again, we're gonna to have to say, is it gonna be the right or left humerus? So let's undo, you can have that in your notes and then I'll just show it to you on the bone. So I'll use the one that's been drawn on because it shows the features better. So this bone, first I look at it and I say, okay, I have the dip in the back. Okay, I'm pointed back. Now I look at the top, I'm like, oh, looks like it goes this way. So this is going to be a left humerus. Now from the top, we'll say this brown shaded area is the head of the left humerus. We have the red stripe, which is the anatomical neck of the left humerus. We have, if I turn this closer, you can see kind of how knobby this is colored yellow. And then, so this is the lesser trochanter of the left humerus. And then this shaded kind of reddish area, you can see it's a lot broader and bigger. That's the greater trochanter of the left humerus. And then this here is our bicipital groove. If I turn it this way, you can see really how much of a groove it really is. And so one of the tendons of your biceps brachii muscle actually funnels right up through it. And so, and we'll be checking that out later. So that's the top part. Then we come down and this area that's been shaded in black is your deltoid tuberosity. Tuberosity means it's a rough spot. So your deltoid muscle that makes up the shoulder, when you put your arm out, it's where it, it sort of makes a triangle coming down off of your shoulder and it's where it attaches onto your humerus. So I'll put this one this side. And so it's, you can feel where your own deltoid comes down and attaches on there. So it's easier if you lift your arm out and it would be right about there. So then we get to the very bottom. Here is the bottom front. You can see this is the spool of thread part. I'm gonna kind of rotate it around. And notice it makes more sense in the back that this double bump here, this two bumper trochlea, actually, if we turn it around, you can see that it really is just a hinge. Later, when we get our ulna, see how this ratchet top part, and we haven't done the ulna yet, but I'm gonna put it on here. It literally rotates around there, and that's how we make our elbow. So the trochlea, is really how this thing, although these two bones don't match, is how it rotates there. So the trochlea is the spool of thread one that allows for your ulna, one of your forearm muscles, bones, sorry, that's going to pivot. It a, forms a hinge joint like on a door. Now this other part here, the rounded component, this is the capitulum. The capitulum is the round one, it's like a cap, so just to get ahead of myself, this here is the radius bone, the other forearm bone that's actually lateral. And what it does is it will be pivoting on the capitulum. Yes, please. Sorry, the mailman just showed up with a package. So, um, so you can see the reason why it's round is the top of this radius, which looks like a golf tee. So I always like think of the capitulum too being like the golf ball. It's got a C shape, it's round like a ball or round like a head because it pivots this way. So and we'll put all these together at some point. I'm not sure how with these bones. Okay, back to the screen. Or right, here we go, this one. Alrighty, so we did, oh, an olecranon fossa. I don't know if I showed, oh, you saw that earlier. That's the dip in the back, our little soup ladle. So here's some pictures that I had from a CD primal picture showing you some of these features. I'm just gonna rotate, I guess it only has two pictures. Sometimes I have a whole series. So now we'll go to the forearm bones. We have the medial and lateral forearm bones. Okay, okay. guinea pig is pretty excited about the male. Okay, so of our forearm bone, I'm gonna stand up on my tiptoes. We have, maybe I should get a marker. 
Ooh, I usually use whiteboard markers because they wipe off. I only have Sharpies in here, so I'm not gonna do that. So on our four forearm bones, the one that's on the thumb side will be our radius. So this is our radius with the, so if we are in anatomical position, that's if you stand up straight and your thumbs are out away from your body and your pinkies, those are your pinkies, I'm holding this your pinkies, close to the midline. That is anatomical position. Even though it's not our natural position, our natural position actually has our hands rotated so the palms are facing back. But we want palms up, thumbs out, pinkies inward. When we do that, then the radius is going to be on the thumb side. Let me stand to the side so you can see my thumb and the radius. And then the ulna, the ulna is the one with this ratchet head, that will be on the pinky side. So your radius and ulna, um, something to say about that, but we'll come back to me. Alrighty, so we are doing the ulna first. Share screen, back to here. So the ulna is the one with the ratchet head. The ratchet mouth part is proximal, meaning it's gonna be closer to your body, um, closer than away. And it's actually going to be the ratchet that attaches to the humerus. Then it has this little lower groove. So if you were to see it in real life, you actually see this ratchet mouth part here. That's what we're talking about here. And then let me switch colors. Just do this little red or something. It has this groove here. You really can't see it very well in this um, picture. But what the groove is, is it faces towards the radius. So I'll show it to you here. So we have the ratchet. I'm going to rotate it around slowly. So here's kind of this mouth, the Pac-Man-y mouth. We see this normal side here. I'm gonna rotate, I'm gonna turn on this above light. I'll make things a little bit better. Oh yeah, that looks sort of better. Um, okay, so we have the ratchet thing, and then this part, that's the little dip. How that ultimately works is this radius, it looks like a golf tee tip, it actually fits right in there. So that's how we can tell which way this goes. We know the ratchet, the mouth, is facing forward. We know the ratchet part is up versus the skinny pointy part is down towards your wrist. So this is up by the humerus. And then the question is, is it gonna be on the right side or left? Well, if we know the radius fits in that groove, then we know the radius is gonna be further out and this one's gonna be further in. So the fact that we have this like this, then you know it doesn't make sense to be on this side because you can see how the radius is medial. So it goes like this because the radius is lateral and the ulna is medial. One way, oh, this was a silly thing I thought of a moment ago. When I was, again, when I was a student, you know, I was in high school in the 80s, and so, you know, we had vernacular that, that you guys don't have now, so a lot of things were really cool, and of course, we had to say they were radical or they were really rad. So it made it easy because the radius is on your thumb side, so if your thumb is up and it's really awesome, then it's rad. That means that's on the radius side. So anyways, you can benefit from my being an 80s girl. Okay, or not, or just embarrassed for me, either way. Okay, so features of the ulna is the, we'll go through this little picture here, hopefully, yeah. So we have the olecranon process. Do you guys remember at the very beginning of this semester, olecranon meant your elbow. And so when we, I'm gonna go back to the unstopping share. So when you stuck your elbows on the table, the point of your elbow is your olecranon. And actually it's your olecranon process. So when you're, elbows are on the table, it is literally your top of your ulna, this olecranon process that's sticking down. And then when you go to straighten your arm out, this olecranon process of the ulna actually tucks into the supladel, which is known as the olecranon fossa. So it's the dip that the process goes into. Okay, it's not getting confusing or anything, is it? Just teasing. I know, it can be quite overwhelming. 
So we have this coronoid process. Now, if we want to psychoanalyze my tests, which I tell people not to, of the priorities, I almost always ask about the electron process because that one is a really obvious, palpable structure. The coronoid process is up just this lower lip. If you think of the whole ratchet as a mouth, the top part is the olecranon process and the bottom part is your coronoid process. But you really can't palpate it because it's deep inside. The olecranon you can point to because when you put your elbows on the table, it's the olecranon process. And in fact, I think one of my test questions is, when you put your elbows on the table, what feature is touching the table? And the answer would be olecranon process or it could be what bone is touching the table and the answer would be ulna. So coronoid process just happens to be this lower jaw portion. Then let's just skip to number, let's see. Number three, the trochlear notch is the actual mouse. So we have, let's say, olecranon process there. I'm gonna put a C here, coronoid process here, but the actual smooth inner surface that's actually going around the hinge of the, of the ulna, which is actually going around the trochlea itself of the, of the, sorry, of the humerus is the trochlear notch. So the trochlear notch rotates around the trochlea of the humerus. The radial notch is going to be that side little one that helped us tell which direction the ulna is at and that the little golf tee head of the radius fits into. And then we have the styloid process. And if you remember, a stylus means a pen. Remember, we had a styloid process of the, of the tr um, temporal bone in the skull. This is a styloid process of the right or left ulna. And it's this point at the very bottom. So let me go to this next picture. You can see here. So we have our olecranon process here, our coronoid process there. If I do kind of X's, let's see, then I'll do trochlear notch is within there. The radial notch, well here you can actually see it hooked up to the radius. Radial notch is there and our styloid process is down there. And again, of which ulna? Well, so if we look at this ulna, we're seeing it's the anterior view. We see this is, the ulna will always be medial. So in this case, it's going to be a right ulna. So all of these will put right up here. Okay. And let's see, I'll do the ulna here with the stop share. Okay, back to the ulna. So we have olecranon process, coronoid process, trochlear notch, radial notch is on the side, kind of this little side of the mouth and then styloid process. And you can see how tiny and pointy the styloid process is. Okay, oops. Oh, and so then this again is the trochlea of the humerus. So the trochlear notch is going to sorry, fit into it like a little mouth and it just rotates around it like that. Okay, now we'll go to the radius. The radius, is the one, so here's the ulna, it looks like a Pac-Man mouth at the top. The radius is here with the golf tee head, but it's flared out. Notice at the very bottom, the radius is bigger than the ulna. The ulna is bigger at the top, the radius is bigger at the bottom. Okay, so we'll go to share screen. So we're gonna look for the golf tee head part, that's the head of it, so that's gonna be proximal. We also look for the really wide part because it flares out, so that's gonna be distal. Now the next thing to look at, if you have one with you, is we want to see, I don't know, you really can't tell in here, but this surface actually scoops up. Oh, some sort of artist, I could do some sort of crazy shading thing. So I'm gonna just point that out to you. I'm gonna stop the share. Set this down. So of the radius, here we have that radius. We have the golf tee head, that's what it says, and we have this wider end. So you can see how narrow, how much, not hugely, but it's just more of a triangular shape. That's gonna be bracketing your wrist, or at least part of your wrist. 
So then we have, so now we know up and down. So the question is, okay, well, what's front and back? I'm putting on my upper arm. If what is front and back? So I want you to look at it when I tell students, we will have like, say here's our table, I have a clipboard. If I set the radius down, you can see that there's a gap under here. Or if I rotate it this way, we can see that it actually shoots up like a little ski jump. Then we'll roll it back over. You can kind of see. Do this one handed apparently. You can see that's convex nature. So how this goes is when you lay it down, the scoop up that faces forward. So when I hold this radius in place, I can see that it's scooping toward you guys on a screen. So I know that is facing forward. So it's facing forward and radius also has a pointy bottom. That is the styloid process. Because the radius is lateral, meaning away compared to our ulna, this pointy part is going to be to the outside. So this particular radius is going to be my left radius. Back to the slides. Okay, so we have the head, that's the golf tee part. Radial tuberosity is this knobby part that's kind of high up. It's a tuberosity, so it just tells you it's a chunky part of bone. We have at the very bottom this ulnar notch because it's like a little divot cut in that the ulna will actually you know, connect onto. And then we have a styloid process. So let's go to this picture. We see the head, oops, head, radial tuberosity, the ulnar, notch is actually fitted right in there. We don't see it. And then the styloid process is there. So we'll stop share. Head, and then we can see the radial tuberosity. We can see styloid process there. And then if I rotate it, there's just a, a dip surface that, it's the wrong one. I only brought one on that now. Here we go. Okay. So this one, these two match. So then we have up here, two match here at the bottom. You can see the ulna goes here. Back to this. Okay. So the bones of the hand. There's eight of them. Scaphoid, lunate, triquetrium, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. They are all grouped in this picture in the green area. They're just known as the carpal bones. Then in yellow, the bones of the hand proper are the metacarpals, and then we can see in blue that are the phalanges that are the fingers that radiate out from the palm of the hand. So the palm of the hand is um, and then the inner base of the thumb part of the palm are known as the metacarpals as far as the carpal bones go you should be able to recognize the names of them i won't have you list them there's just too many other things to know about but i want you to know them so that if i were to say someone broke their hamate bone then you'd at least know what part of the body we're talking about it's in the wrist so if I want you to know these in the sense that you would recognize them if they were written. You don't need to know them that you would have to come up with the name yourself. I'm not going to say, tell me the names of the carpal bones, but I may, I would ask you, you know, the pissy form is located what part of your body? And then you'd say that would be the wrist, you know, so at least you know where they're located, but you don't have to name them or list them. This is more just information of them. And some, sometimes we go through them as a whole list and you'll actually see them. All right, the guinea pig is going now. So this here is the hip hands. So you can actually see if we take some of the muscles off, we can see the bones of the hands. 
Here's the carpal bones, there's an x-ray. This is the palmar surface. Sorry, not the guinea pig, it makes me nuts. And now I have a cord going across here. But on here, I want you to actually look at the bottom part of this is the ulna. That's the styloid process of the ulna. This here is the radius. And that's the styloid process of the radius. So you can see when someone breaks their wrist, you can see how they can break the styloid process of the ulna very easily, especially if their wrist got cocked off to the medial side in a weird way, because it's such a small piece of bone, it can actually get broken fairly easily. The radius is pretty strong here at the bottom, and then you can see this is that little ulnar notch that the ulna would fit in. There's cartilage in between them, that's why there's that gap. Here's more pictures of here. This is actually, there's a ring. That person's wearing a ring. That's what that's about up there, that white line. The metacarpal bones are named starting from number one being the bone the, by the base of the thumb. And then it's named outward. And they're used Roman numerals to do that. So the pinky, the metacarpal just under your pinky finger is no, metacarpal number five. Then the phalanges, all the fingers have three except for the thumb only has two. So that's how we get a total of 14. We're sort of obviously one short from the 15 if you were to say three. And here we are, the one through five, but they, even though in this picture, they're not putting it as Roman numerals, it's normally supposed to be the Roman numerals. And you can see the radius only in the carpal bones. So you should be familiar with the head of the humerus, that's a smooth part, the anatomical neck, which is right behind the smooth part, you have the two tubercles, greater and lesser. You have the groove between them. You have the rough spot where the deltoid muscle attaches to the deltoid tuberosity. You have the wide spot, medial and lateral epicondyles. So like, what do you mean by wide spot? I forgot to show you. So if we were to take our forearm or upper arm and run our fingers down, where our fingers end up, you can actually feel your medial epicondyle and your lateral epicondyle in that um, when you palpate yourself that way. And then the trochlea and capitulum, they're within the elbow joint. The trochlea is the one that's being pivoted upon when you flex and extend your arm. The capitulum, I didn't give you this motion, but remember, that we are in anatomical position. So our thumb is out, our forearm is down, and we have our radius. Now when we go to, the motion is, we haven't learned it yet, but we go to pronate. Our hand up is supinate, and pronate is when we turn our hand over. So when we turn our hand over, let me grab my skeleton guy. Hopefully, Hopefully he can do this. I haven't tried it on this one. I usually do this with the skeleton in the classroom because I know his arm pivots, but let's see about this guy. Okay, so when he is in anatomical position, the hand, when we go to rotate, oh no, he, yeah, we'll, I'll make it. I might, I might break him though. So notice, again, this is why it's important that the golf tee part is round. It literally rotates, oh no, it's, Oh yeah, I'm kind of doing it. I think he's gonna break. We, hmm. okay, there it goes. When we move our arm from flat to over, turning it over, like we're holding a bowl of soup and then we dump it over, what happens is our radius just rolls here. So feel your, your elbow, your other arm, and if you're holding things up and you're rotating it down, Right up the top, you're really staying the same. You can feel the bones moving. But what's really happening here is that your bones are parallel. And when you go to flip your arm over, it's the radius that literally flops over the ulna and it makes an X. So when your radius and ulna make an X, that's what's like when your hand is flipped over. Like when you normally stand and your thumb is, instead of an anatomical position out, the thumb is actually rotated in. Our radius and our ulna at the top are still in position, but at the bottom, the radius flopped over to the other side. It's also why we have anatomical position with our palms forward and our thumb out, so that the radius and ulna. 
but the capitulum is what it pivots around on. And then the olecranon fossa is the hole in the back. The ulna, that's the ratchet bone. You have the olecranon process, which is the part that's gonna stick on the stand on the tables when you put your elbows on the table. The coronoid process would be the lower jaw of the ratchet mouth. The trochlear notch is the smooth surface of the ratchet. Radial notch is a little tucked in part that the top of the radius binds to. And the styloid process is the pointy part at the bottom. The radius, you have the head. Radial tuberosity is just a bumpy part on the radius. Ulnar notch is where they're bounced together and the styloid process points to the bottom. So when we do, oh, why was this way over here? Didn't we already do this one? The head of the humerus, medial, oh, okay. Spine of the, we didn't do this one, sorry. I was just looking at the scapula at the top and thought we did that. Okay, so on this here, what we could name from this, if we say spine of the left scapula, that would be this part. The acromion of the left scapula is going to be this part. Then inferior angle down here, that's our inferior angle. And then we have our lateral border of the left scapula. Well, we also have the medial border, but that doesn't look like it's listed. Then we have our head of, our, of the left humerus. That would be this area here. Olecranon process of the left ulna. That's gonna be this part right here. Medial epicondyle of the right humerus. Where would I put right humerus? Oh, that's not on this particular picture, okay. I'm just picking one thing. So this would be the medial epicondyle of the left humerus, however. So we can't find that on this picture. Trochlea, we can't find that picture, blah, blah, blah. Everything's right. So that's all we can do on this picture. So this particular bone is because we have this posterior view and this is gonna go into, so it's like you're standing behind them. So this is going to be, both of these is the right side. So that's where we can say medial epicondyle is the real pointy one. That's here, medial epicondyle. The trochlea is this area. Olecranon fossa of the right humerus is this dip portion there. The deltoid tuberosity of the right humerus is just a rough spot here. It's often difficult to see on a picture, unless you really, but it's the only feature that's gonna be in the middle of the shaft, essentially. Bicipital groove or intertubecular groove, you can see that right through here. Greater tubercle, it's gonna be on this side. You can actually, and then we have, oh, sorry greater and lesser tubercle. Then we have the capitulum of the right humerus. There we go, capitulum. And the lateral epicondyle sits right above it. The, and we can't see the Ullman radius. That must be on the next page. Yep. Trochlear notch, the right ulna. Radial tuberosity of the right radius, that's this part. Head of the right radius, there. Then we go down to the bottom, and then notice there's both a styloid process. We have the styloid process of the ulna and the styloid process of the radius. Then, oh, we go back up to the top here to the coronoid process of the ulna. Okay, so here and let's see here. So then we're gonna go on to the muscles, or sorry, muscles, I keep saying that, the bones of the leg. We have the thigh as well as the lower leg. So let me go back to the PowerPoint, get out of here and so we're, we will skip through the pelvic girdle. So advance in your notes until we get to part four, the lower limb. So let me share that. 
share. Okay, part four, lower limb. We're gonna do, this is the part in your lab guide that you may wanna follow along with, the femur, the tibia, fibula, tarsal bones, metatarsals, and phalanges. So the lower limb includes your thigh. So this is actually your upper part of your lower leg is known as your thigh, okay? That's pretty obvious. But when anatomically, when you say the word leg, actually we think of it as the lower leg, but that's known as the leg. Actually, it has to do with comparative anatomy with animals. Um, the, the leg actually is what you see sticking down, say in a horse or dog. Okay, so the thigh is essentially the upper leg. When the word leg is in reference, it anatomically refers to the lower leg. I generally just say upper or lower, just to be clear. The patella is our kneecap. I don't have a patella in here. We have ankle bones. So remember the wrist bones were carpal, where the ankle are gonna be tarsal. And then we have the same thing going on in the foot. We have the metatarsal, so there's gonna be five of them. They're named from the big toe over. And then phalanges. We also have 14 phalanges in our toes. So the femur, this is how we're gonna to try to orient it. So let me stop sharing, I'll grab a femur. We have a nice big one here, so it's a long one. This one's probably, this one would be one that would be like for someone my height, it seems to match. Yeah, this one's definitely not me. It doesn't match very well. Sorry, the guinea pig is, this must go. Sorry, the guinea pig is being too noisy. So this has been the femur. Let me set this down. We have obviously, this is gonna be the head and we can see the bottom part here. These are the lower condyles. So this is gonna be the distal area of the femur. So when we look at the femur, we know the head part is gonna be facing to the middle because obviously that's gonna go into the hip socket. So the question is, is this femur gonna go this way or does it go this way? So notice we have these bumps here at the top and it's a little smoother in the front. The bumps here are facing backwards. So that by itself helps us to say that this will be a left one. When we go to look at the bottom part, you can actually see we have these two rounded surfaces, the condyles, but when we rotate it around, there's a huge dip between the two of them. This giant dip faces backwards. So we know that's gonna be the back. So just based on this, we can rotate it around and say this is the front, and we know this faces medially, so it's the front, so this is definitely a left femur. And then we're gonna go through the features. So we have the head, this round bulbous part. We have the, um, an anatomical neck, and again with the surgical neck, but here's our neck. We have the two bumps. This is a greater trochanter. Now remember, in the humerus, we had a similar thing going on. We had a head, but then we had the bumpy parts, but they were called tubercles. People get them mixed up all the time, and that is a test question. So you're definitely gonna need to know greater tubercle, lesser tubercle on the humerus, greater trochanter, and lesser trochanter on the femur. So they're real analogous, just tubercle means it's smaller and less robust. So we have the greater and lesser, and in fact, let me see, if I put this here, when you feel, let me just put, aim this down. So if you feel like the point of your hip, so you have your, where your waist is, and then where the point of the hip is, that actually is your greater trochanter. That's what you can feel there. So obviously your acetabulum is encompassing the head. So when you feel from your waist and you go down, kind of on the side of your hips, the first part on your leg that you feel this is your greater trochanter. Anyone has tried sleeping, camping, and they have a really thin mattress and they sleep on their side, will know their greater trochanter does not feel very good by morning. Then, as you go down the shaft, just like in the humerus, we had a deltoid tuberosity. Remember, deltoid was your arm muscle here and it attaches halfway down your arm. Well, what do we have down in our lower? We have our butt. 
which is the gluteus maximus. It attaches gluteal tuberosity. So there's a whole rough part, kind of, and it's like a ridge line, and it really goes quite a long distance down the surface of the femur itself. So this whole kind of rough spot here is known as the gluteal tuberosity. So it's a lot more, and your gluteus maximus is a big muscle, so it has a longer attachment point. So your gluteus maximus will do, obviously it's attaching to the back of your leg, and so it's going to like pull your leg back. So if you're gonna kick, it's the thing that pulls your leg back to start the swing. Okay, we get to the bottom. And if you were to run your fingers down, and you run them down, and the widest point that these fingers hit are the epicondyles. And that's look where the head is, so it's facing in this way. So that makes this your medial epicondyle, and this one your lateral epicondyle. Then we're gonna rotate around. I think I'm skipping on the line on the list, but this giant dip between the two is your inter, meaning between, condylar notch. And then ultimately, the bottom surface, this really smooth surface that we would rotate on. And in fact, I brought you some knees that I um, plastinated. So this knee is a, this one's an elk knee. Well, they all are elk knees I use. Well, no, I have a little deer knee. I get them from the slaughterhouse. So this one's a deer, this one's an elk. So. Maybe I'll show you the, I'll show you both of them. So the elk knee, so my, my contribution to science that I presented when I was in China was I make, I'm one of the few that can actually make these where they can still bend and rotate, but they're plastinated enough to pull, keep them in formaldehyde. So this is a real knee that came from the slaughterhouse and I plastinated it, but, and we'll look at it again when we actually do the knees, but I wanted you to see the condylar surface here, it still has the cartilage on it, and it rotates this way. So the condyles are actually doing some rotating. And then we have the intercondylar or not, where you can see there's a blood vessel right through it. Let me show you my dear knee. And you can see this little guy too. So you can see the condyles. We have a ginormous patellar surface in the deer, but the, um, their femurs are actually really small. It's actually what's up in their hip. And so, um, it's by if you're like touching a horse by the flank, that's actually where their kneecap is. It's really weird um, anatomically. Okay, so that is back to here. So we have the condyles are on the bottom. Epicondyles are just ridges that sit up above them. So the condyles are within the knee joint itself. So let me go back to the PowerPoint. Make sure I didn't miss anything. I think I got it all. All right, so we'll go through this. Head neck and um and I'll, and so and then greater trochanter lesser trochanter gluteal tuberosity medial epicondyle this is the medial condyle the smooth surface then we have <clears throat> sorry lateral epicondyle meaning above and then we'll do lateral condyle the smooth surface and then in between on the posterior one, you'll see a little number 10 inside there because that's the intercondylar fossa or intercondylar groove it can be, but a fossa is actually bigger, so that's more accurate. Um, so again, we have to say the proper name, we, whether we say this is the head of the right femur, this happens to be a right one in this picture, or you know, if we're gonna say this is our medial epicondyle of the right femur, or in this case, this is a lateral condyle of the right femur. This is the greater trochanter, and this is the lesser trochanter. Okay. The point of this is all the colors really are muscle attachments, but what I really want you to see is the angle that it sits at. So the point of the hip that you can feel is your greater trochanter. And so in males, the angle is less severe than if it was a female. Females' pelvises tend to be a little wider. So their femurs actually stick out, so their pelvis sticks out here. So they actually have a more 
severe angle than males do, where males' legs are more straight up, where women actually have, you know, more of an angle that way. That has some significant biomechanical disadvantages for females, but it, it occurs because we want to actually maintain a larger pelvic basin, obviously, because somebody may want to get out at some point. So that's what the point of this picture is. But it's a, quite a nice picture where we can actually see our lateral condyle and our medial condyle and our nice intercondylar fossa. And then along here is the gluteal tuberosity. Okay, what's next? So on to the APR worksheet. What can we see from this picture? We can see head of the left femur. So this will be the left side, so it's really clear that you want to be right versus left. We have both obturator foramens. We did that the other day. The ischial tuberosity of the left ischium, so we'll have to figure that one out. That's going to be right here. Lateral epicondyle of the left femur. Okay, so if we say this is going to be our left side, this is going to be our right side. So if we're going to say lateral epicondyle, it's going to be the outside and it's going to be up. So that's that there. Greater trochanter of the right femur is that. Lesser trochanter of the left femur is that portion. Okay, we can't see the gluteal tuberosity because that's on the back. So we'll this one put the line through. Neck of the right femur, that would be there. Lateral condyle of the right femur. Well, we don't see it that well, but technically it would be right under there. And the medial would be right under there. And we'll we'll deal with the other parts. Head of the right fibula is right there, but we haven't got a bone yet. This is the back side of the femur, so this is where we can find our gluteal tuberosities. Well, it says of the left femur, so we'll leave it on the left. And we can see a number of things, like the neck of the right femur. So by labeling these, it gets you used to utilizing right and left and looking for right versus left. So we can see medial epicondyle of the left femur, that would be here. Lesser trochanter of the left femur, that's there. Greater of the right, so we can label all those things on this, most of those things on this image as well. We get down to the patella, that's just our kneecap. So the kneecap is an interesting little thing because it's just the sesamoid bone, and I have a kneecap, sort of have a kneecap for you. Where is it? Okay. Sorry, I got too many bones laying around. Okay, so this is one of my other placinated legs here. This is a, from an elk. Again, their femurs are really short. So here's a pretty big elk one, and you can see this is a femur that's probably the size of a person my height. So you can see how much bigger the human one, because this is the one that's like up in there. Like if you're petting a horse and you have your hand on their top of their butt, looks right above where their tail comes in, that's going to be the back, like where their sacrum is. And so from the side of the butt down to their flank is their femur. And it's just in the corner of their flank is actually going to be their patella. So this year is twisted. So this is not one of my great ones because one of the ligaments broke. But I keep it because you can see inside the knee way better. But the point is this is I wanted you to see the patella. We can see the patella, which is the bone here. And you can see the hyaline cartilage and how it actually fits into this patellar groove. In the elk and deer, the patellar and horses, any of those four-legged animals, the patellar grooves are a lot more prominent than our pathetic patellar groove in humans, but that's because we stand upright and they have more of a bent surface. They also can run faster than us for a number of reasons, one of them being better biomechanics of their back legs. But that's for an exercise physiology or exercise biomechanic class that we won't be doing here, but it would be fun to do if we did. Okay, so where we have the patella, the part down from the patella that I'm holding here to the shin bone below, which is the tibia, is the patellar ligament. But from the patella up to the thigh is where your quadriceps muscles, that would be your quadriceps tendon. So we'll talk more about that when we get to the muscles, but 
that's what I'm referring to in this slide where we say it has a tendon on one side because it's attaching to muscle, but on the distal side, it's a ligament because it's attaching bone. Ligaments are bone to bone, where a tendon is muscle to bone. So from the patella, one side is a tendon, the other side is a ligament. So we're down to the shin bone, our tibia. The tibia is right here, and it's pretty easy. So we'll show you here, I'll stop here. Here's our tibia, really wide at the top and kind of funky at the bottom. See this funky thing that staying hangs off? We probably are gonna be tempted to call it a styloid process because well, in the radius, it kind of looks like the styloid process of the radius. But because it's so giant and chunky, this is going to be our medial malleolus. That's the kind of crazy name, medial malleolus. So if you are feeling your legs, let me see, your ankles, oops, let me see if I can, I have my slippers on, so I better take them off. So, okay. I need to practice my yoga more and if I'm paying on to this, so I better get Christina, she can probably do it. So anyways, here is my foot and your, um, so if you do wear, let's see, you can aim this down. Last time I did it, I'll put my foot on the table and the points of the ankle that you can feel here, the outside and inside, will fit this point here that we all say, oh, that's my ankle bone, the ankle bone is actually your shin bone, and actually, where did I put it? Is actually your medial malleolus of the tibia. Whereas your outside ankle bone is, we haven't gotten to it, it'll be your lateral malleolus of the fibula. Okay, so the tibia, how do we tell if it's right or left? Well, we know this hook part, the malleolus, is gonna be medial. We know the flat part is going to be up. Okay, this is down and to the middle, and this is up. And then this, see how it arches backwards? Well, it has this knobby front part. You can feel that on the front of your shin. So again, with the video, I'm going to go down. So where your knee is, the front of your shin, if you can feel it right there, you can kind of feel a knobby part, that's this, tibial tuberosity. So your tibial tuberosity, is gonna face frontwards. So this guy, we have our tibial plateau, tibial tuberosity, so we know it's frontwards. We know, okay, medial malleolus, we know that's gonna be medial. So it makes sense that this one would be my right tibia or a right tibia. The last feature, so we talked about the malleolus, medial. We talked about the tibial tuberosity that actually the quadricep or the patellar tendon is going to attach to. That's why it's so big and vigorous. The other thing is the intercondylar eminence. Now I just list that because it's got, it's got a cool name, but also because so many people deal with knee injuries and it's right inside the knee capsule. And because the condyles, oops, clicked on something, the condyles of the femur that's what they're gonna rotate on. But notice this upper part between the two. It's known as the intercondylar eminence. So you think it's between the condyles, that makes sense. And then the word eminence, what is that about? So I always remembered as a student thinking, eminence, like, oh, he said that to a king. Oh, hello, your eminence. And then I picture a king wearing a little crown. So in my warped mind, I'm like, oh, that's like a tiny little crown. So there you go. Inter, it's between the condyles of the femur, intercondylar eminence, because it's sitting on the top like a little tiny crown. So of the tibia, we know this is a right because this thing's gonna stick medial. This would be intercondylar eminence of the right tibia, tibial tuberosity of the right tibia, medial malleolus of the right tibia. Okay, back to the screen share, click over. Here we go, those are the three. Intercondylar eminence, tibial tuberosity, and my little arrow needs to be more here. Oh, okay, good, I think I solved that problem there. And then our medial malleolus. There we go again, intercondylar eminence, you can see it there, tibial tuberosity, 
medial malleolus. In this case, this is going to be the front, so we know this is the right tibia. The fibula, this one's way the hardest one. Well, it's the easiest and the hardest because pretty much you have the head and the lateral malleolus. So that's the way easy part. I'll just do the stops here. Here's your fibula. Long, skinny, you have a head, you have a lateral malleolus. I won't make you have to do right or left because this is by far the hardest one to do right and left and you really have to be in person with it. Unless you see it on a picture with the tibia, then it's pretty much obvious what it is on the leg. But if you're seeing a standalone bone, you really don't have to know right or left because it's way hard. But I'm going to tell you anyway so you know it, but you don't have to be tested on it. So first of this fibula, notice it's named fibula and not fibia. So there's a tibia, but then there's a fibula with an L. And the L helps you know that it is lateral. Fibula is lateral to our tibia. So here's our tibia. And so therefore, if this is our medial malleolus, our fibula would have to be lateral to that. They don't match, there we go. So fibula with an L in the name is lateral because it's lateral in your body. Then you have two sides. Here's one side. Can we bring one? Oh, we have one fibula. This side's more bulbous. This side is more tapered. The tapered side is down. The roundy bulbous side is up. Okay, that's pretty much all you can. So head, lateral malleolus. Okay, I'm gonna do the share screen back here. Okay, so the head is bulbous, lateral malleolus is distal. You can see it actually has this kind of little taper point down. We have more of a bulbous head up there. So the head is gonna be proximal. The lateral. So the two ankle bones, we have the lateral malleolus of the right fibula in this case, but we have the medial malleolus of the right tibia. Okay, there's some other features. Now the tarsal bones, cuneiform. Okay, get a little M here because the picture's on top of the text. So we have seven tarsal bones. I'm going to only make you have to know two of them. You should know the, if you hear, hey, someone broke their navicular bone or they have a you know, fracture in their lateral cuneiform. No, it's in your foot. It's your tarsal bones. But you don't need to know which is which. The two that you do are circled. Your calcaneus is your heel bone. So that's what we can feel. And your talus is the smooth one here. This is the talus. I'll put a T under it and a big C. So this is your calcaneus and your talus. I forgot to grab a foot while I was at the lab. Okay, oh, one, two, did that. Three, oh, we don't have to name that. So you have to know number one and two. Here's another picture, a nice one of your calcaneus and see how it sits way back. Later, when we do muscles, your Achilles tendon is actually properly known as the calcaneal tendon. It attaches to your heel bone, which is your calcaneus. The talus bone in here, the reason why I want you to know it, is because that's the bone that your foot actually pivots on when you're going forward and back. Let's see, what's next? Okay, so I'm gonna get, hmm. I wish I would have remembered to bring a foot home. I know that sounds really gross and scary. Okay, so we're going to get Skeletal Man, maybe his leg bends. Okay, we're going to do a yoga move with him that I could not do. So notice the foot goes this way and that. So on yoga Skeleton Man, this is the calcaneus, and then the talus is actually right under the tibia, and it's this curved portion here. So it actually arches. It looks like one of those little quaint little bridges that go over a brook. So it's curved because then your tibia actually rotates forward and backwards over that. So your leg or lower leg that we like to call it, the tibia, will the proper terminology is articulate. That means interact with, articulates with the talus bone. 
because that's what it rotates over when you make your foot go forward and back. Dorsiflex and plantar flex is actually the proper term for that. Okay, we're just about done. The agony is almost over. Okay, here we go. So we have five bones of the foot itself. So the foot are known as metatarsal. So remember tarsal, when you see that, that's referring to foot. Remember carpal was gonna be your hand. So our metatarsals are these guys. My pen is doing a weird delay, okay? And then the phalanges. And we have 14 teeny tiny bones that make up the phalanges. That's because two of them are the big toe and then the other toes have three little tiny tiny bones. So on our lab guide, you should be able to know the features of the femur, head, neck, greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, and you can color them on these pictures here. Gluteal tuberosity is gonna be here, medial epicondyle, remember that's up here, versus lateral epicondyle. The condyles are the actual smooth surface. You don't see the intercondylar fossa or notch because it's on the back in this picture. Our tibia, we have our intercondylar eminence at the top, tibial tuberosity, and our medial malleolus. For the fibula with an L, we have our lateral malleolus and the head. For the tarsal bones, just know that we have the calcaneus there and the talus there, and the rest are just, you should recognize if you saw their name and identify that they are bones within the foot. And then we have metatarsals are the main foot bones here, and then phalanges is the same as the toes. Let's see. Okay, so on our APR, medial malleolus of the right tibia is that. Intercondylar eminence is here at the top. Then we go lateral malleolus of the right fibula is there. Head of the right fibula. Tibial tuberosity of the right tibia. The patella is not in this picture, neither is a capsule. We'll go to the next picture. All right, here we have patella. There's your patella. In this case, it's a right patella. And what about the talus? This is a really great view of the talus right here. You can actually see that it's there immediately under. We can see it on this side. We can see how really the tibia articulates with it where that lateral malleolus, the fibula, is just more bracketed. It's a place for um, where our outside ankle bone is. Um, ligaments kind of curve around it. It actually holds a few ligaments as it goes through there. Um, but it's really not what we pivot on. We pivot on the talus itself. And then our calcaneus is right there. That's our heel bone. Okay, lateral condyle of the right femur. So this is medial, this is lateral. So this is our lateral condyle, the right femur. And then our medial, I'll just put an M in that one, medial condyle. Metatarsal bones are these long bones there within the foot. The tarsal bones are the more knobby, rock-like looking bones in that portion. Let's see. Okay, so now here's some fun. I'm gonna show you some x-ray images. We should be able to see some cool stuff here. Great, now you can recognize we have our sternal end of the clavicle, chromial end, chromial process of the scapula. We have this really cool glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa. We have Really nice view here of that intertubecular groove. Actually, I think this thing's labeled on the next one. Oh yeah. Okay, so you can see it labeled. You can see some cool stuff here on the x-ray. You can see here our humerus and our ulna and our radius. So you can see the golf tee of the radius and the capitulum that it would rotate around. Um, the trochlea, coronary process. We have a side view here of the elbow. Great picture here of the hand and the carpal bones and a nice, really prominent styloid process of the ulna. And you can see how more robust the styloid process of the radius is. Then we can see in this picture how the um, 
actually these holes are pointed downward. This is more normal of our anatomical position. We can see our greater trochanter here, our neck, head of our femur here. We see a slight little bump representing the lesser trochanter. This one, okay, our obturator foramina sticks down. We can see, yeah, so you can see this one labeled. This site down here at the Watt is rate a radiology site for the University of Washington um, in, in Seattle. And so this site is has awesome radiology images. And actually we go to this site, not this exact one, but we do their um, they have really great muscle stuff. So when we get to the muscles, we'll be actually visiting the Washington site as well. We can see really nicely the intercondylar eminence, so it's a feature that you will have a will notice when you look at um, knees whether you're going to work clinically, you can actually see how they help the position the menisci. There's a side view. This is a nice view of the talus and the tibia, how they interact. And you can see how the end of the fibula just sort of helps to bracket that to keep your, um, uh, your flexion and extension or rotation of your foot, which is actually dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, keeps that aligned. Nice side view. So the talus has this really characteristic, nice smooth surface. This here is our calcaneus or our heel bone. Okay, let's get some little problems with the sesamoids. There we go. Oh, this just looked horrible. This came on my Instagram the other day. Ankle fracture, no kidding. Oh my goodness, that looks so painful just looking at it. So you can see the whole bottom here. There's the talus, there's our tibia, and it's not where it should be. Fibula, long gone. The fibula is such a long skinny bone, here it is, that it didn't stand a chance at all. So this was obviously got hit from the outside, so it moved medially. All right, to end on that one, sorry. That was kind of a scary looking break. So. Okie doke, that was it. So we powered through, didn't make, try to make it not as long. Uh, Monday, we'll have a quiz over bone features. So I will do, probably I'm trying to think if I might do both pictures and I can hold it up and kind of do that. I'm gonna try to figure out, again, I haven't written it quite yet or I have one that's already written. I'm just choosing whether I'm gonna use it or do a fresh one. But to remind you, you can go to Canvas, you can go down on the page and see the skeleton feature cheat sheet. So you can print that off and have that with you because you're gonna need to name those features. So you just have to already know what they are. They're listed alphabetically. So if you're, I'm pointing, you know, we end up doing something like this and we have this sort of medial malleolus of the tibia and you're like, oh, some malleolus, you know, at least you can spell malleolus correctly and you have medial malleolus and you can, so if you kind of, it can help jog your memory, but it is listed alphabetically, so they're not by bone, um, but you can print them out and mess around with them. It's just on the quiz, I need them with no other writing. It just is gonna be only that page. And then I have one for muscles that you can use when we do the muscle part as well. All right, I think that's it. Any questions? Okie doke. Thank you guys.